let me get you to how Darwin got bitten by this earthworm bug. Now, as all of you know, Darwin set forth on his uh, uh, voyage out on the world uh, on his HMS uh, Beagle that took him uh, across the seas for 5 years between 1831 and 1836. So, he started from Europe, went all the way to South America and then went to the Botany Bay in uh, Australia and thereafter went back, came to Cape of Good Hope and then went back to London, Europe. This 5 years was uh, admittedly a very taxing and some uh, uh, time for Darwin and as some of you would pursue at some time or the other, you would find that it is riddled with lots and lots of enlightening tale, but that cost Darwin his health. And so, no sooner than he sort of landed up in London from his uh, HMS voyage uh, trip, he became sick and that was a recurrent feature by the way, I would like to mention uh, as a digression, that was a recurrent feature of Darwin. Now, he was ever so often sick, but if you would now go to the pages of history of Darwin, he would now convert the sickness into what we may call as some sort of a you know uh, uh, gain in terms of using that time to reflect upon his journey and then sort of assimilate and then bring about a synthesis. Now, it was that what happened to him at the end of his trip from HMS Beagle, he fell sick and he was advised complete rest from his doctors. <coughs> so, as a part of recuperation, uh, getting back his uh, strength and energy, he decided to take refuge in his uncle's uh, farm. His uncle happens to be a gentleman called uh, Josiah Wedgwood, also often called popularly by Darwin as Uncle Jos. And it was Uncle uh, Josiah Wedgwood who lived in his farm, you know, a, a very tranquil farm where Darwin sort of spent months there recuperating from his 5 years uh, voyage. And during the time that uh, he uh, was with uh, Josiah, uh, Josiah introduced uh, Darwin to this business of earthworms. Now, English are very fond of earthworms. For what reasons? Two reasons. One is English like earthworms because they are very, very uh, fond of fishing and for fishing you need earthworm as a bait. Uh, the, other, the other reason why English are fond of earthworms is because they like to have their garden spick and span all the time and they would like to have good humours and stuff like that. And so, they knew that earthworms can give them good humours and so, they both were the reasons why most of the British were very keen uh, guys. Uh, liking earthworms. But Josiah, besides that, he was interested in earthworms from a different uh, uh, perspective altogether. And that was the amazing turn of the soil that these earthworms now did to the soil in which they apparently lived and foraged, if you have to use that word. And as you see in the slide, uh, they would just sort of turn the soil upside down make it more aerated, porous and of course, contribute to the degradation of organic matter which is more available, which could now make uh, carbon more available to the plants. It is in fact called farmer's friend, it eases the resistance of the soil such that the farmer can till his land much easily. Okay. So, what Josiah in fact showed uh, uh, Darwin was one spectacular observation. Joshua was also interested on earthworms and so, what he did was on his farm, he had uh, put on the top of this uh, profile of the earth a uh, piece of charcoal and limestone, strewn it around and just went about his daily life. After few years, what he would observe is this charcoal and limestone that he had strewn across on the top would actually be taken inside the soil profile thanks to the churning of the soil by the earthworm. So, this charcoal and limestone that you see, the black and the white uh, sediments, they are the charcoal and limestone respectively, they were actually planted by Wedgwood on the surface of the soil. But over years due to the turning by the earthworms, these 
the loamy soil went up and these uh, sediments went down and that was attributed to the turning of the soil by the earthworms. Josia mentioned this to Darwin. Darwin was absolutely, you know, absolutely amazed by the power of these uh, invertebrates. So much so that he became so sort of enchanted by this uh, entire observation. But remember, Darwin has now returned from his HMS Beagle voyage, handling uh, huge continental scale issues that finally of course led to the origin and so Josiah was aware that he Darwin is no small man he is sort of having the world uh, as a burden of uh, for explaining uh, the various issues that he was engaged in. So he mentioned to Darwin that well what I have just now shown you is perhaps a very small issue and I do not think you might be interested considering the fact that you are engaged with explanations on a more larger scale, a continental scale. And so, he sort of just went about uh, his routine. Lee suspecting that what Josiah showed Darwin was going to change Darwin's perspective of earthworms and of course, the other things that would follow. Yes, please. Question. Yeah. So, in the previous slide, you have A, B, C, D marked next to the, I think, uh, you they refer to the layers of soil? They refer to the layers of the soil. So, what, what distances are we talking about here and what time scales is and how long did it We are talking about time scale of about just about 5, 6 years. Okay. Yeah, I do not know about the depth of the profile, uh, how much it would be, mm -hmm. but I am talking just about, it is just about 5, 6, 7 years, that is around the time scale. And if I have to do a second guess, I think this are going to be in some uh, couple of uh, feet or three or four feet. That's from the sort of from the sort from the top. But I'm not sure of that. Okay. So what happened then? Having sort of bitten by uh, what he saw uh, from his uncle's observation, Darwin decided that uh, let me make some observations, and he did make some observations and. Uh, just a year later, not barely a year since he went to Josiah's house, he wrote up a paper called on worms forming mold that is vegetable mold. And uh, this paper he read out before the Geological Society of London in 1837. This is the oldest geological society uh, in the world. He was uh, subjected to a certain amount of ridicule when he uh, presented this paper. And that stemmed uh, from the Victorian sort of uh, ethos which regarded studying worms as not a necessarily a Victorian issue. And so anyway, he uh, took the brunt of all of that. But after he presented this paper, uh, this guy William Buckland who was a leading geologist then recommended Darwin's paper for publication and uh, it was published, but it is important to tell you that Buckland after reading and hearing to Darwin, he goes on to say that it is a new and important theory to explain phenomena of universal occurrence on the surface of the earth. In fact, a new geological power, that is a very loaded sort of sentence to be made, but that is what William Buckland mentioned. And this sort of reinforced Darwin that indeed he has chosen a right topic uh, to go about his work. Remember in 1837, Darwin is just now getting out of his voyage. He has not had enough time to you know uh, confront with all the huge amount of data he has collected, material that he has collected. But besides all of that, he is sort of enamored with this invertebrate and so you should now put it in a temporal context of what is happening. He started actually if you want to date it, he started formally studying earthworms in 1837 when he presented his first paper to the Geological Society of London. And it so happens that he became so I would say uh, uh, interested in earthworms that he decided to do anything and everything that's, uh, that could now give him a great insight on these earthworms. And one of this 
is called the worm stone which implanted in his house in Kent called the down house where he stayed for most part of his life and this radial stone that you see is planted to see how much will this stone sink into the earth thanks to the earthworms working underneath and central axle that you see is actually the axle which now measures or gives a measure of how much it goes down. And uh, even today uh, if you go there you can actually see this uh, uh, stone uh, uh, buried there. Uh, then he sought earthworm cast, the mud cast that you see they are the earthworm cast. He got this cast from far and wide from all over the world and this picture shows earthworm cast that he got from the Nilgiris from our country. He got uh, earthworm cast from uh, the botanical garden of India, uh, the Calcutta botanical garden which the British started and he also uh, dug up trenches uh, in his uh, farm in the down house uh, to see exactly what Wedgwood showed him of how much these uh, charcoal and limestone are going to sort of bury themselves in due to the movement of the earth by uh, the earthworms. So, the study that began in 1837 shows that it worked itself across the timeline and until 1881. It took him about 44 long years of study to come up with a treatise on earthworms. And after this work, he wrote up to his publisher. Now, there is something very uh, good about uh, you know the um, early scientist. Now, they would not really publish in a hurry like all of us. We need a paper every week. Uh, these guys would amass should I use the word lifetime of findings and put it in a manner such that they would have spoken the last word on the subject. Charles Darwin wrote to his publisher John Murray and I should read up uh, what uh, to you what he wrote to his publisher. He wrote to Murray, here is a work which has occupied me for many years and interested me much. I fear the subject will not interest the public, but will you publish it for me? Now, please remember he was all I already mentioned that the paper that he read to the G Geological Society of London was not really well taken simply because at that time it was not a fashion to study earthworms. Moore, who had by then published more than 16 books for Darwin, perhaps out of modesty and politeness replied, it always gives me pleasure and hope to hear an author speak thus, what is a subject? John Moore does not know it is earthworms, so what is a subject? Earthworms replied Darwin. History says that when John Murray heard this one, he was taken momentarily taken aback. No publisher wants to lose money and this book is not going to be, not one copy is going to be bought by someone. So, how should he be publishing it? But now that he has published 16 books of Darwin out of sheer uh, loyalty or let us say friendship, he decided let me go with it. And so, Murray agreed to publish and the book on earthworms was published in the month of October 10th, 1881. That is the book and I picked up by some miraculous luck the original edition of this book. And uh, two months after its publication, John Murray called Darwin and told him, we have now sold 3500 worms in less than a year in less than a year, the book went through six editions. Belaying the earlier ridicule, people actually love this book. So, in within a year, even uh, you know, a, a romance novel or a thriller or whatever it is would not go six editions in a year. It went to six editions in a year. That speaks of the fantastic uh, popularity that it gained in uh, the United Kingdom. A lesser known fact about this book is a small should I use the word idiosyncrasy or uh, inadvertent sort of uh, miss up is if you look at the front page of the book, it reads the formulation of vegetable mold through the action of worms. On the spine of the book, it reads earthworms. So, there is a small slip between the earthworms and the worm, 
I do not know if it is deliberate, but uh, that is sort of recorded by historians of science saying that is a quite a significant uh, stuff to observe. Five months after the publication, this was published in October 1881. Five months after the publication, Darwin died in April of 1882. That means, this book of Darwin was his last. Also, it so happens that this book was and is one of the least known books uh, of Darwin. Unfortunately, it is not in the mainstream of uh, Darwin's work and uh, it is not as well and widely known as many of the other books uh, that Darwin uh, published. Uh, but nevertheless, historians of science tell us today that this book probably has contributed in very large measure to a wide variety of fields as I mentioned to invertebrate ecology, to geology, to behavioral ecology uh, work all the three. In terms of its uh, lasting contribution, it seems to have laid foundations for these three areas. Now, let me with this background come to the actual observation that uh, led him further into investigating earthworms. Uh, 